I'm Jay Lovell. I'm the host of PsyQ on the Young Turks Network. On my channel, we talk about the intersection between science and politics, which is why I'm delighted to be emceeing tonight's event. Um, as you all know, America and indeed the whole world are suffering from a bout of alternative facts. Instead of seeking to know the truth, our public and our policymakers are only too happy to occasionally promote a comforting lie. Uh, but there's only one type of facts, real facts. And tonight we're going to be celebrating tw the 25th anniversary of the Skeptic Society, a group of people who have been fighting fake news wherever they find it, fighting for reason and science and searching for truth even when it hurts. We've got an incredible lineup of celebrities, thinkers, and philosophers with us tonight. Now, this is a live show. You might notice the cameras around you. And because it's live, you might see a few technical things happening. Uh, but don't worry, we'll keep the entertainment coming. And to start us off for the night, we have the nerdiest of musicians, the peer-reviewed rapper, Baba Brinkman. <laughs> Thank you, Jade. So uh, let's get the first slide of my little set here. I have been asked to open this event because I am both a rapper and an arch skeptic, although I'm trying to soften a little bit by instead of thinking what I believe and what I disbelieve, I try to think about how much do I believe in things? What's the probability that something is likely to be true? And uh, I was also, unlike most rappers, I would guess, influenced by this individual, the Reverend Thomas Bayes, who worked out the mathematics of probability, which I'm about to summarize in a rap song. You have a prior belief, that's the upper right, you measure it against the likelihood of certain evidence showing up if the belief is true versus if it's not true, and you end up with a posterior probability, that is how likely the belief is to be true, given the evidence, you get new evidence, and you update your beliefs. It turns out that is not just a formula for trying to figure out what's true in the world and being a skeptic and being rational. It's also how our brains perceive the world in general, right down to perception. So let's take a look at this next video. This was produced by the Sackler Center for Consciousness Science in the UK. And uh, all they've done here is they've filmed the college campus at the University of Sussex and run it through an algorithm developed by Google called Deep Dream. And Deep Dream scans photos on the internet, looks for patterns in the photos, and tries to predict the presence of certain things in the photos based on matching the patterns with the tags. This is a Deep Dream analysis of the video where they've changed the parameter to make it oversensitive to the presence of dogs in the environment. There's a few too many dogs in this video. In fact, there's no dogs. All it's doing is amplifying anything remotely dog-like and making you see what it would look like if it was a dog. But here's the thing, this is how our brains see everything all the time. None of you has ever seen a dog directly in your life before. What would it mean to see something directly? There is no light in the brain, there's no sound. All there are is neurons firing in response to the stimuli that hit your eyes and your ears, and your brain has to make some kind of a best guess or prediction, actually a Bayesian prediction, about the likely source of that signal. Then it takes new information from the senses and adjusts the signal, the prediction, but what you see is the guess. What you see is not the direct access to reality. So basically, we are all hallucinating all the time. Perception is a controlled hallucination. And when we happen to agree on the details of our hallucinatory content, that's what we all call reality. And that's what skeptics are trying to hone in on. So this is the predictive processing model of consciousness, the Bayesian brain. I want you all to switch on your processors, and we'll see how deep the rabbit hole goes. This is also a good model for understanding optical illusions, because you have competing predictions switching back and forth in the brain. What? Double take, look twice, calculate the odds, roll the... Predict the next rhyme. Consciousness turns water into... Look around, you see faces, places. You really think you're taking in this information from the outside? Nah, it's generated internally, a controlled hallucination. Cascades coming from the top down, interpreting ambiguity all around. The brain doesn't see sights or hear sounds. It takes in signals that it's gotta figure out. Bam, 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 go the axons firing. Action potentials coming up the wiring. What is it, a friend or a predator hiding? Threats to survival are so exciting. 
So make a prediction, compare it to the signal, calculate the difference, what's the residual? Now let that info update your best guesses in a cascade of predictive processes. Double take, look twice, calculate the odds, roll the... Predict the next rhyme, consciousness turns water into... Perceptual basics, ask Morpheus, we live in the... Tricks. We just see what we think we see It's nothing but a shadow of a possibility Bam, 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 go the axon signals And somehow your brain converts those to visuals Even fast asleep with eyes closed When there's no feedback from the outside world To revise the code To give it relevance Interpreting all the predictable elements in the images Your brain does it superbly Only novel information is newsworthy And it's not just perception only It's action and cognition Predictive coding has to figure out whether a signal's phony So take steps, get your fingers probing Investigating points of contact Your Bayesian brain makes bets on dog tracks Or wolf tracks Or whatever's up next That's relevant to survival prospects Or reproduction Let's not forget your brain calculates the odds of hot sex every few minutes or seconds or less depending on present context Double take look twice we can't see right like the three blind Predict the next run if I was rapping like a mute you would call me a Perceptual basics if we didn't have gravity we would be we see what we think we see Damn, that girl just winked at me Expectations of expectations Governing internal bodily sensations Maintaining a sense of homeostasis As your brain sits in a lonely oasis Just an organ, a tool that's evolved To do a job, to compute the odds Of the causes of its own moods and thoughts And the contours of what a body moves across Even your emotions are just predictions Of internal and external influence I get pissed off and that's just my senses signaling a preference for something different That's how my ancestors got selected Okay, stop, cool off, pay attention to my sense of self And goddamn, I predict myself, therefore I am Double take, look twice, I'm a white rapper but not vanilla Predict the next rhyme We're trying to make a dollar from a nickel and a Perceptual basics, ladybugs like to eat aphids, yeah, we see what we think we see. Ah, oh, my brain hurts, let's drink some. I would have gone with tequila, but I. Thank you very much, I hope you enjoy the show. I'll be back. Who said science can't be awesome? Well, it wouldn't be a celebration of 25 years of the Skeptic Society without the founder of the Skeptic Society and our host for the evening, Dr. Michael Shermer. <laughs> now, Michael, you'll know better than anyone that skepticism and disagreement can come at a cost. Um, especially on the internet in, the, in this internet era. And uh, by the way, if you'd like to see this panel again later, you can check it out on the Skeptic Society, the Young Turks Network, or PsyQ, or Deepak Chopra's channel. You'll have to hunt around. Um, especially in the internet era when reason and logic quickly lose, na lose traction with people you know, calling names and being trolls. Um, but I know that you're a true skeptic and you're willing you know, to take a punch now and again in the name of truth and reason. Um, so in the name and the spirit of skepticism and embracing disagreement, Michael, I believe you've invited a skeptic's skeptic tonight, someone you've often profoundly disagreed with and yet you still managed to call a close friend. So let's get him out tonight. Founder of the Chopra Foundation and co-founder of Gyro and the Chopra Center for Wellbeing, Dr. Deepak Chopra. <laughs> Michael and Deepak, tell us about your long history of being skeptical of each other's views. What is the benefit of having conversations with people that we disagree with? Right. So, uh, well, let me just give a, just a kind of a general background to uh, what we do, the Skeptic Society and Skeptic Magazine, of which I am the publisher. It's the um, 
quarterly publication of the Skeptic Society. We're a 501c3 nonprofit science education organization devoted to investigating claims of the paranormal, pseudoscience, fringe groups, and cults, and claims of all kinds between good science, junk science, bad science, voodoo science, pathological science, non science, and plain old nonsense. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm no Baba Brinkman, but hey. Uh, and, uh, and in case you've been in, uh, abducted by aliens and been on Mars, you know, there's a lot of it out there, nonsense. Uh, I mean, we talk about fake news and alternative facts, but this is what we've been doing for 25 years. It's always been a problem. It's just highlighted a little bit more now uh, because of the internet and, and uh, the real-time spread of, of these kinds of ideas. So this is what we do. It's what we've been doing, and we'll continue to be uh, doing that, hopefully, for another 25 years. And um, so by way of background, uh, I mean, every uh, issue of Skeptic Magazine has a particular theme. We put a cover on there of somebody or something we're debunking. By the way, debunking has kind of a bad rap uh, as a name, but let's face it, there's a lot of bunk that needs debunking, so that's part of our job. But more importantly, I'm interested in why people believe whatever it is they believe. Like, get at the core of the psychology of beliefs, which is the basis of most of my books. And one of the most interesting people we've ever investigated is Deepak. So he was on the cover of Skeptic. We did a, a beautiful illustration of him, and uh, after, uh, w which was the, the, the sort of icing over the, 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 the hard-hitting article inside. Uh, so we've had kind of a testy relationship over the, over the decades, to put it mildly. Part of the problem, I think, as we've seen with, with, with politics, is you know, the atheist, skeptics, humanist uh, movement is like any other group. And, and, and you tend to be polarized against those who you disagree with. And honestly, over the last quarter century, things have become more polarized. So a couple of years ago, when, after Deep, Deepak and I did a debate on uh, ABC Nightline, and it was pretty testy. I mean, you can watch it. It was pretty contentious. And uh, so we really weren't speaking for a while. But then. Uh, when my wife got pregnant, Deepak was kind enough to invite us down to his center in uh, Carlsbad, California. And my wife said, we got to go. And I said, I, I can't, I can't like, be in the same room with this guy, can I? I mean, we're supposed to be enemies, and you're not supposed to talk to the other person. Well, then she talked me into, you know, let's try it. Okay. And then I started realizing over the last couple of years with all the campus un uh, uprest, uh, un unrest about uh, hate speech and free speech, and we have to ban speakers and we can't hear what the other side has to say because we might not like it. And I realized I really got to talk to this guy. Uh, and so that's when we went down there. And, and since then, we've become kind of friends, even though we still disagree on some basic fundamentals. But he is the skeptic skeptic. So you'll notice I'm wearing a little skeptic pin here. It's gold. It's one angstrom's thickness of gold. Uh, but it's still gold. So I brought one for Deepak. I'm going to pin Deepak now as a true skeptic skeptic. Skeptic, skeptic. Now, do you you agree now that I am correct about everything we've been? <laughs> May I respond? Please. <laughs> so next time you give me this pen, it should say radical skeptic, because I'm a radical skeptic. Radical skeptic. Okay. Which the position of a radical skeptic is, if you can see it, touch it, taste it, smell it, think about it, imagine it, conceptualize it. It's a controlled hallucination, as Baba said. Yeah. What is real is that which you cannot see but makes seeing possible. That you cannot perceive but makes perception possible. That you cannot imagine or conceptualize but makes imagination and conceptualization possible. And that is a dimensionless, timeless, without cause, fundamental, ontological, primitive, that, if you have to use a word, would be awareness. So Baba said, uh, I predict, therefore I am wrong. I am, therefore I predict. Wow, OK, I have to unpack this now. <laughs> that was a lot. It was profound. I, th I think it was profound. Uh, <laughs> So here, herein lies part of the problem is language. So uh, when you immerse yourself in Deepak's worldview, like we did in, at a center, you kind of get a, a feeling for the sort of Buddhist uh, consciousness first perspective. And those words kind of make sense from that perspective. So if I can articulate your position and tell me if I get it right or not, uh, that the, what I call the weak consciousness principle, that is, 
in order to experience anything, you have to be conscious. So consciousness is first in that sense. It, 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 it's, it's before everything else that comes, or else you would not perceive anything if you're not conscious and sentient. If you're dead, you're not perceiving anything, obviously. So that seems pretty true by definition. But the strong consciousness principle, which I think is your position that I disagree with, is that consciousness creates reality. But, but, uh, but as you know, most scientists think, well, reality is actually out there. I mean, this chair is, is real. And if a bat comes at it, it's going to dodge around the chair because the chair is really there. But you think that species-specific perceptions are the reality that are all different from one another. And each of us has a different reality in that sense. Did I, did I get that right? Partly. Um, I would say my position is um, consciousness only monism. Your position is matter only monism, if I guess, yes, that's right? right. Yes, yes. So my position is consciousness only monism, which means that consciousness experiences itself as activities of consciousness, which are sensations, sense perceptions, images, feelings, or thoughts. That's all we experience. And then after that, we create constructs around our perceptual experiences um, that we call mind, brain, and universe that what we call the universe, what we call the mind, or what we call the brain, or what we call a body are human constructs. Let me try and experiment with you, if you don't mind. All right. What is this? That's a watch. What's that? That's your shoes. What is this? That's your, your jeans. What is this? That's your hand. What is this? That's you. OK. <laughs> so these are human constructs. Yeah, but they're really good constructs. Wait, wait. Of <laughs> course, they're very useful constructs. We, we use constructs to do science. We use constructs to uh, do theology, philosophy, all systems of thought. But as raw experience, all that is, this is a shape and a form. That's a color, shape and a form. A smell, a texture, a taste. And then an interpretation of that. Oh, that's a hand. That's a body. That's a shoe. Okay, anything that you can name from a gluon to a quark to a galaxy to your body is a human construct. We are right now experiencing a human universe. What does the universe look like to an insect with a hundred eyes or to an eagle or to a bat that navigates the world through the echo of ultrasound or to a snake that can only sense infrared or to a honeybee that looks for honey through uh, ultraviolet. Okay. So what is reality? And on that note, what is reality? We're going to have a number of different people come out and help you decide on the answer to that question. But it's good to see that you're already disagreeing about everything. So that's <laughs> exactly what we'd planned. And we can still be friends. Who or what is it that disagrees? 